Hey everybody, Hugh Brownstone here for Planet 5D, and I'm delighted to bring you Chuck Westfall, technical advisor, also known as Mr. Cannon in the uh, film world. So Chuck, really happy that we can take the time to chat today at Cannon's 2015 Expo. It's a pleasure, and I'm glad that you could join us here. This is a fantastic exhibition for you. So just for those people who aren't familiar with the Canon Expo, can you explain its frequency and its purpose and mm -hmm. the kinds of things that have been introduced before and what's especially noteworthy today? Well, we actually started doing this uh, way back in 1987, which was the 50th anniversary of Canon Inc. And uh, then we switched over in 1990, I believe, to uh, like an even number of, of uh, years there. So that uh, every five years since 1990, we've had this Expo. We do it in New York, Paris, and Tokyo, and then recently we started doing it in Shanghai as well. So uh, we're trying to basically uh, use this opportunity to try and uh, let people see what the entire depth and breadth of, of the company really is. Because uh, this, it is so, uh, so diverse that a lot of people who are familiar with maybe one or two aspects might not uh, realize that we have so many other things going on. You know. I get it now. We talked briefly before we went on camera and I told you that I started with a Canon FTQL back in the early 70s when Canon was a relatively young company. And for me and for many people, Canon meant cameras. They meant 35 millimeter cameras, including things like the Canonet rangefinder style camera. But I was able to take a walk through before I sat down with Chuck and not to put too fine a point on it, but holy crap, this is a conglomerate. Uh, the pavilions here, there are what, half a dozen different pavilions? Can you just walk us through those? Yeah, we actually have almost a dozen here at the Expo. And uh, essentially what we've done is to try and uh, show each part of the company and give you a little bit of a flavor. So um, starting off with the camera side, you know, we're doing a, a representation or a kind of an artificial Yankee Stadium background uh, where we have it's all crazy. the EOS cameras set up. Um, so people can actually get out there and shoot uh, pictures of uh, baseball players uh, and see the performance of the equipment in a real, kind of almost real life situation. I have to tell you that uh, the sharpest lens I personally have ever owned was the predecessor to the Canon 200mm uh, f2.0 that I saw there, the 1.8. Right. Incredible. I, I got a Jones for it, but that's above my pay grade, so not going to happen this time. But really extraordinary. Canon knows how to really put on a show here. I also saw the uh, industrial uh, pavilion where they were doing virtual reality. Right. Uh, I was in the medical pavilion, and this is interesting. Uh, right next to the medical pavilion was Canon's future, University. Correct. And that is where. Canon is showing the 256 megapixel, 256 megapixel, 256 megapixel sensor as a concept? Yeah, at this point it's not uh, in an actual product that uh, has been named. Um, and it, uh, by the way, it is 250 as opposed to 256, but uh, that's... My computer background. <laughs> there you go. What's Thank a couple you. of megapixels between friends? Yeah, really. <laughs> Thank you. So. In any case, uh, uh, it is a, a sensor that uh, is designed so that it could fit into any number of different cameras. Um, it's an APS-H size, which is the similar size to what we had in cameras like the EOS 1D Mark IV and the other EOS 1D cameras before that. I bought the original 1D in 2002. Four megapixels, and it still took great pictures. Yeah. I've got one hanging on the wall in my home of the, uh, the light memorial for yes. Twin Towers. Yeah, that was a great start to the lineup, uh, and, but in a way it was kind of like a, a, a one-off because it's the only EOS digital SLR ever that had a, a CCD sensor. Everything else ah, uh, that we've done CMOS. has been a CMOS that we've made uh, on our own and it, we've evolved uh, quite a lot over the years. Sure, and the APS-H is between the APS-C and the full frame, which is why the 1D had a 1.3x crop factor? Exactly right. And at the time, that was one of the uh, the main selling points of that camera because what it was going up against were, were cameras that were designed to the older, smaller APS-C. Uh, so by having a, a larger sensor format, that enabled us to actually improve the image quality compared to what was out, out there at the time. Now, one thing that we also talked about briefly before we came on camera was that five years ago, Canon uh, showcased a 120 megapixel sensor. 
and it, it never found its way into uh, imaging products of which I'm aware, you said as much. So now we have a sensor with twice as many pixels. How should film people, still photography people, think about a 250 megapixel sensor? Is this something that is going to be meaningful to them 10 years out? five years out? Is there a higher probability that this puppy is going to be commercialized within the five year uh, time frame than the 120 megapixel was? And now that I'm asking all of these questions, how's the uh, 5DS doing? Uh, because that currently is the uh, high megapixel champ in the DSLR form factor. Well, we'll start off with that one first. Uh, it's getting a fantastic reception from the people who've actually tried it. Um, of course, there's always going to be what I'll call tire kickers out there. We're going to look at a spec sheet and uh, find something to pick over. But uh, in any case, uh, once you actually have the camera in, in hand and you're actually able to produce images with it, that's where it really shows the power that it has. Um, a fantastic image quality. Um, and, you know, it does have certain limitations compared to some of the other sensors that are out there in terms of the ISO range. But on the other hand, uh, for the vast majority of assignments that, uh, that people uh, are likely to, to need to have to shoot in digital format, this camera does a fantastic job. It's, it's a very interesting and valid point because if you're looking for a 50 megapixel sensor still camera mm -hmm. and you're willing to make that investment, then it is probably likely that you're spending that kind of money not just on the camera but you're spending it on crew, you're spending it on location, you're spending it on lighting. And one of the first rules of a DP, let alone a still photographer, is to reduce the dynamic range through the use of additional light sources and light shapers. So on the other hand, if you're a one-man band, if you're a small production mm -hmm. house, which is the vast majority of, of Planet 5D readers, I'm interested in Canon's sense of what's important to that market, to, to your point. Uh, no newsflash, the Sony A7S is the current low-light champ. Uh, the 5DS twins are not designed to compete against that. In fact, the, the video side has been pulled back, which leads a lot of people, and I'm one of them, who have said, okay, it seems to me that Canon is really bifurcating now, and you've got the lower end uh, in the DSLR form factor represented by up to, say, the 750, 760D the 7D Mark II, the 5D 3, 4, that's a middle ground. And then you've got the Cinema EOS. And Cinema EOS really are designed for just video. So in that 7D 5D space, mm -hmm. what does Canon think is most important? You're responsible for giving a, a feel of the market back to Canon. What do you see out there? Because like you say, there, there are tire kickers out there, but on the other hand, there are people who really need that dynamic range because at that price point, kind of 1500 to 3500 range, people don't have the money to get the crew, to get all the lights, right. and so they need greater dynamic range, or they want to do more artistic stuff where they're going even more light. It's not lost on me that when the 5D Mark II came out, Vincent LaForet actually shot at night and it was considered a low light monster. Yeah. So, you know, in reality, uh, we understand that the, the market for, um, I would say, cinema quality video is going to be always, you know, growing, especially now that uh, it's become so affordable uh, to be able to produce a high quality result. Uh, and what's different uh, about today's market compared to what it was when the 5D Mark II came out is that you have a, a, a much wider group of people who are interested in producing this kind of content. So our first reaction, of course, was to develop the Cinema EO system, which really did uh, address the idea of having high quality imagery using a large uh, format image sensor and the EO uh, infrastructure as far as the lenses are concerned, but a very, very video focused idea. The other side of what's happened, though, in the last five years is that the mirrorless cameras have started to really appear. Um, and uh, we've seen, you know, cameras from some of the other companies, and I don't want to start getting into naming names, but you know who they are. Fair enough. Um, I do. 
that are, are starting to make an impact on the market and uh, the market is telling us that this is the kind of camera that they are interested in because like you said it starts to reduce the form factor and the cost factor so especially for uh, somebody who's operating on a limited budget it's something that they're very aware of and they're looking to try and accomplish what they can now another approach that we've taken recently is to approach that from a camera such as the xc10 which is not the, the answer for everybody. We understand that. But at the same time, it does give us a dimension that we didn't have before, which is basically a competitively priced camera that can do 4K video, as well as full HD up to 120 frames a second, with a, a, a fixed lens that it has a pretty good range on it from uh, effectively 27 to 270 when you're shooting in video. Uh, so that's one approach. As we move forward, we're definitely considering where we're gonna go next we don't know if it's going to be the best thing uh, to follow with the existing DSLR form factor. I don't want to say we don't know, but my point is, is that we're going to watch what the market tells us as to whether they prefer that style or whether they might prefer a more like a mirrorless style where, uh, you know, that would lead us into developing a different line of cameras that we don't have yet. It's, it's really interesting because I think that when one looks at market share statistics, Canon continues to dominate the overall camera sector, but DSLR uh, unit volumes are dropping pretty precipitously. Canon's profits were down 16% in the most recent quarter. Um, and the mirrorless segment is, is really taking off. And I guess that is in part responsible for the introduction of the EOS M3, which to be fair to the market, with everything else that's out there by companies that shall not be named, I would assert that it's not the most competitive offering that, that Canon has come out with. Well, for video, it's definitely not that, uh, that uh, kind of camera to compete against the likes of the 4K cameras that are there, because it doesn't have a 4K feature. We all know that. Um, it was really designed more for the photo enthusiast. Um, and I would say that uh, it kind of follows the uh, shall I say, more conservative uh, line of thinking that uh, uh, this is a primarily a still camera with a video feature added as opposed to a primarily video camera. You know, that's a, a great distinction. Right now, we are shooting with a, an Apple iPhone 6, mm -hmm. not, not the newest one that was just announced, but an iPhone 6. And, uh, you know, just as a couple of guys sitting in a pavilion, it's an amazing little thing. It's a phone but it's also an incredible still camera for casual film users and with the 6s we're now talking 4k out of a phone uh still only a single uh, focal length uh and a 12 megapixel sensor so i guess my question to you is to what extent uh is canon feeling pressure on the one hand from again companies that shall not be named who are in the same kind of price as the 5D3, same kind of space, uh, and just above it, uh, let, let's say the pricing of C100 land, uh, and then coming up from the bottom with, and the Apple iPhone is not the first 12 megapixel sure. uh, 4K smartphone, so how does Canon feel about that? I think one of the things that you got to look at from our point of view is that we're always going to try to uh, look at image quality uh, as one of the most important differentiating factors in our equipment. And we've really tried very hard to, to make that happen. Now, you know, it's arguable. You can talk about uh, different aspects of image quality and you can make a point uh, about one thing or another, but uh, I think the bottom line is the market has told us, just by the virtue of the fact of our sales, that they like what they're getting from, our, from the Canon product that's out there. That's a good thing. What we need to do then is to be able to find the areas where we can still differentiate ourselves in terms of image quality and still be affordable and still be durable uh, enough to uh, to give people a product that they're going to be proud to own and be able to use for many years. It's an interesting point. Canon, especially Canon glass, is known for having just lovely color. Uh, and Canon was the bomb. In fact, the 5D Mark II and basically invented the sector. Interesting, though, that, that from what I understand, Canon didn't anticipate that it would take off quite the way that it did. Yeah. So, so how, what was that story? Well, it's a very interesting one because uh, the original uh, intent of putting video on the camera was uh, to answer the request of the wire services who wanted to be able to uh, cut down to a single piece of equipment in the field instead of carrying a still camera and a video camera 
they would be able to give uh, one uh, device to a reporter and, and have that person be able to produce video as well as still imagery. Um, and uh, I think the, uh, the concept of having uh, cinematographers actually take that equipment and really make something professional with it was not on the original game plan. A happy mistake. Yeah. You know, so, so clearly, uh, once we saw what was going on and the reaction, it was, it was unbelievable uh, to us at the time. Uh, we got started right away on, on thinking of what we could do with it, and the Cinema EOS is what came out. Well, I think uh, people who use the C100 and the C300, C500, somebody like Shane Hurlbut, they love them. Uh, but to your earlier point, finding that trifecta of image quality, durability, and affordability really seems to be the key issue these days. Uh, so, again, back to the concepts that you're showing here today. Mm -hmm. We talked briefly about the 250 megapixel sensor. We haven't really spoken about the low light monster. We'll right. come back to that because I really want to talk about or ask you about the applicability of those two technologies in particular to segments other than filmmaking. Mm -hmm. They basically scream out other applications. Right. On the other hand, I went through with a, the technical term is freaking magnifying glass to look at the 8K uh, imagery and the technical term is holy crap. So why don't we talk a little bit about the 8K concept for a minute. Sure, and this is really, uh, I think, a very good example of uh, uh, how Canon really does look ahead in terms of technology and how it really anticipates what the market is heading towards. Um, the 8K video one of the important features that it has is basically the idea that uh, the level of resolution is so high that it actually exceeds the uh, of human ability for resolution at a normal viewing distance. So if you uh, get to the point where you're looking at a computer monitor, even uh, close up with a magnifying glass, you still can't see the individual pixels. That is true. I can vouch for that. And so. That's really showing, I think, a, a lot of uh, forward thinking in, on Canon's part to, to be able to develop that technology at this stage of time, thinking ahead to you know where we're going to be in the next four, five, ten years. Um, you know, we know that uh, we're not the only company involved in this area. There's a whole lot of other people who are going to be along there with us, but uh, we want to be in right from the ground floor, and, and we're doing our best to make sure that it happens on the optic side on the sensor side and also on the display side. So we have a complete input to output story. It's, it's very interesting. So there are some of us, I'm one of them who says, I love the concept of 4K. I understand what the value of 4K is as far as being able to crop. The workflow is a bear. As soon as I go 4K, I've got to add piles of disk, Thunderbolt, RAID arrays, I'm going to have to go to core, you know, quad, quadruple, quintuple, sextuple, you know, a lot of cores. And yet, research indicates that sometime in 2016, mobile viewing will surpass television and desktop viewing for video content. So you sit there and say, oh my God, Netflix, Amazon, the cable companies, they're already compressing the hell out of these things. Where does 8K fit into that? The infrastructure isn't really mm -hmm. there yet for 4K. So when we think about an 8K concept, are we thinking this really, within the next five years, we might not even see it in cinemas yet? Uh, but do you think that, that we're going to see this in consumer-grade products in the next five years? Well, here's where I'm going to go with that. If you look at the cinema industry as an entire industry, one of the most important aspects that it has is the actual movie theater. Yes. And the projection of uh, the image onto a theater screen. They have to continually try and move the, the game forward, push the envelope, develop the technology to the point where they've differentiated themselves enough so that you as a consumer are going to be willing to spend the money to go sit in the theater and watch that as opposed to watching it at home on your home theater. That is a fantastic point. And it's analogous, I think, maybe to the music industry where with the advent of Napster and its successor iTunes, the iStore, uh, iTunes Store, that, that musicians make their money not on album sales but on live touring. It is an event. People are willing to spend a lot of money on a ticket 
to get an experience that they can't get at home. And I think that's what you're saying 8K is all about. Yeah, because you know, right now 4K is already the standard for movie theater projection, and it's really uh, you know already lifted the experience way beyond film ever could. Um, we already know that, but uh, the 8K is definitely going to take it to another level completely. Um, and it's the type of thing where the technology is already in hand to be able to deliver that experience in the theater. The next step is then going to be how do you translate that into a broadcast format so that it can be delivered to the home. Um, and we know that, uh, that the, the, the wheels are already turning to make this happen in Japan. They're basically looking to the 2020 uh, Olympics in Tokyo, which we're, we're only five years away and, and it sounds like a, a long time for in some contexts, but uh, in other contexts it's very short. And uh, so if we can get to the point where we're able to have a, an 8K broadcast in the year 2020, then I think that what we've done is to actually reduce the cost to the point where basically it will be able to use 8K uh, uh, capture in many, many other areas besides professional broadcast. What a wonderful use case for that technology. That makes complete sense. At 8K, let alone 4K, does Canon believe that it has to come up with a next generation for basically all of its optics? Or are lenses like the 200 f2 uh, today good enough to go all the way up to 8K? Uh, well, if you really want to make that distinction, you've got to uh, look at the format that you're going to actually be capturing on. Uh, now, 8K at this stage right now is probably going to start off in the Super 35 format, not the full frame 24 by 36. With that as a uh, kind of a, uh, a uh, starting point, then you start looking at uh, the lenses that you're going to develop uh, that are going to fit that format. Now, I'd have to say that uh, lenses like the 200 f2, just as they are right now, are probably more than enough to, to handle an 8K. Um, but the reality of it is, is that you're going to have to have a whole stock of lenses all the way from those ultra wide angle up to the ultra telephoto that are able to go into that format. You know, it's interesting, in your APS-C cameras, you came out uh, with the EF-S series of right. lenses. Uh, much smaller, much lighter, much less expensive. Uh, interestingly enough, when you do apples to apples, when you put an L-glass 70 to 200 on an APS-C sensor, uh, you can't capture all of the sharpness in, in that kind of lens. So you really did a heck of a job with the EF-S lenses. And most recently, you've introduced STM technology starting again on the EFS lenses, but now you've introduced those on a couple of EF lenses. Is it reasonable to expect that over the next couple of years, not in five years, but sooner, that the uh, EF lens line will be revamped to include STM technology? Um, it's a good point. Um, and here's the story. This is going to be interesting for your viewers. The STM technology, the value that it has, really is, is the silence of it and the smoothness of it. Um, on the other hand, the STM technology as it exists right now is not powerful enough to drive a heavy lens element. And that's one of the reasons why the only lenses that we're putting it into are those that have internal focusing components that are relatively small and lightweight. Interesting. So, in our case, when we look at the entire line of VF, EF lenses, there are going to be lenses, especially as we get into the more pro lenses, that have bigger, heavier groups of elements that have sure. to be moved. The STM technology at that point is no longer appropriate. So what we're working on is basically other forms of technology that will get us the ability to move those lens elements quickly and quietly, but also get the same benefit that we have from STM in terms of the silence and the smoothness. Um, and that's essentially where we're headed now. It, uh, I can tell you that uh, without getting involved in, uh, in uh, breaching any information here, that uh, basically this is what's on the way. That's really interesting. And that leads into uh, another question, which is, Again, for filmmakers, not for event uh, videographers, but for indies, documentary, and you know, budget uh, feature length uh, narrative films, there is a preference today in 2015 for manual focus, manual focus racking, and it's not just STM lenses, it's the current generation of smaller, faster, uh, faster in terms of focusing, not in terms of f-stop lenses, where it's fly-by-wire and it makes manual focus pulling nigh on impossible. 
Now, on the one hand, Canon's been a leader with things like dual uh, pixel autofocus. Uh, but I wonder if what's also in Canon's lens future is a technology which, on the one hand, allows that fast, silent focus movement when you're autofocusing, and yet somehow has a second mode to allow you the fine-grained precision that's necessary for a good focus pull. You're smiling at me, Chuck. Yeah, because actually we explored that idea um, all the way back in uh, the uh, early part of the 2000s when we introduced the first generation of the um, uh, super telephoto lenses for the EF system. This is before image stabilization now, so we're talking uh, like in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. What we were able to do at that time was to come up with uh, basically ability on manual focus. It was focused by wire, but we had uh, one, two, three settings that you could set for low, medium, and fast manual focusing. Like these uh, settings in automatic transmissions and sports suspensions now. Right, exactly. So, uh, you know, depending on what the application was, we recognized that a sports photographer would not be interested in, in spending all day turning the wheel. You know, uh, they want to be able to get from point A to point B very quickly. Whereas, on the other hand, a cinematographer would definitely prefer to be able to have very fine control. So, um, that ability to uh, do the adjustable speed on focusing is something that the fly-by-wire approach actually supports pretty well. Are we talking about a firmware upgrade? Um, well, no, I think it's more than that. Because, okay. it, you know, it, what it eventually comes down to is basically adding, you know, some functionality to not only the firmware, but also the hardware of the camera to support it. You know, we've had it and we got rid of it. You know, one of the things that uh, was going on back then uh, was the idea that people wanted to veer away from electronic manual focus into the mechanical manual focus so that they wouldn't have to worry about uh, uh, losing the ability to focus when there was no power. But, you know, there are different ways to skin a cat. And I think in the last 20 some years, you know, we may have come up with some uh, new ideas. That begs another question, and I know we're uh, limited on time. I think we're actually running a little bit over, so I want to be mindful of that. But it, it really does beg the question of integration with smart devices, smartphones and, and tablets. The ability to, for example, have not just a touch screen, but to have a smartphone where you can dial in the speed of the focus pull. Magic Lantern, we can mention that. Uh, was uh, revelatory in its ability to offer certain functionality through sure. software. But has Canon been thinking, has Canon been developing along those lines where you could take a smartphone and say, okay, here's point A and here's point B for the, for the rack focus. Here's the speed that I want that rack focus to occur. Sure. And by the way, I want to ramp it up and down. Yeah, actually, we've already uh, started, <coughs> excuse me, developing uh, technology along that line. Because, for example, you've already seen on the 7D Mark II the ability to adjust the speed of the focus pull in the dual pixel CMOS AF. So that part is there on the camera side. Then on the other side, as far as being able to control it remotely, we're doing that now with the Cinema EOS product. We have a, uh, basically an iPad app that uh, allows you to do all the, not only uh, the focus pull, but also, you know, touch the screen as to where you want it to focus so that you can go back and forth between your two actors. Yes. And uh, this way, uh, there's there's almost no limit to uh, the technology that, uh, that that interface can support. Do you think that that interface will migrate its way down into consumer uh, gear? Well, I can't predict exactly what we're going to do, Fair but enough. what I will say is is that uh, that the technology exists for us to be able to do any number of different things uh, using this basic idea of an iPad type interface. Um, and we're very clearly uh, trying to imagine the different ways that we could do this in an economical way um, that would still support the features that people were looking for. All right, so one last question, and that's to return to the uh, low light monster that we saw. Sure. Uh, I have to tell you, I saw it in, in the context of surveillance and oh my goodness. Let's talk about that kind of sensitivity finding its way into uh, consumer and prosumer products. What can you share with us? Well, what I can tell you about is that uh, the reason that we developed that sensor was not for consumers. It was really, <coughs> excuse me, for uh, uh, primarily uh, government and military use. Um, and what we really have uh, noticed, of course, like everybody else, is that the consumer market has shrunk. We are looking for different avenues for us to be able to not only push the technology forward, but also find a different customer base. And this is one of them. 
uh, a good opportunity for us to be able to do that. Um, but uh, what we're seeing with this sensor is not just the sensitivity that it has, but also the ability to do video at 30 frames per second with that sensitivity. And therefore, we can start getting involved in some of the applications that a consumer might be interested in. So, for example, uh, a nature type photographer who's trying to record a nocturnal animal of sure. some kind is going to find some value to this. Sure. Um, also, uh, people who are trying to do uh, documentation of the various different uh, celestial objects, you know, they might find that there's some, uh, you know, way to be able to, uh, to do either video or time lapse with this type of technology. You know, you've been uh, really generous with your time, but now I lied. I'm going to ask one more question because you just <laughs> came up with it. So celestial astrophotography. Uh, so with the 250 megapixel sensor, mm -hmm. in combination with that kind of low light sensitivity, the press release said that you could read the lettering on an aircraft from what was it, 11 kilometers away or 20, whatever it was. That also says industrial application. And, right. And that's where you're going with it. Well, the 250 megapixel uh, right now, that's the primary market that we're looking at. But one of the things about that sensor, uh, and one of the ideas is that you can take any one 125th of it and make a full HD video out of it. So you, you talk about uh, uh, the, the ability to crop in, and then this is essentially uh, an area that a lot of different people can exploit. Well, Chuck, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of Planet 5B readers for taking the time. It was an illuminating conversation. My pleasure. Nice to uh, have a chance to uh, meet you in person, Hugh. All right. Guys, Hugh Brownstone for Planet 5D. See you next time.